Testing one, two, three, four, five. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. sleeping thy presence my I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance. 
Whoa. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Welcome to Faith Baptist Church. We have a few announcements and then a time of prayer we'd like to have before the service starts. But before that, we'll have to have our update from the Remnant Cafe, a wonderful opportunity for outreach that goes along with a growing list of things that we can do as a church family to reach out to our community. So is it Cindy or Gerilyn? Both. Cindy and Gerilyn will now come to you and give you the update on the Remnant Cafe. Good morning. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, we wanted to give a quick update on the uh, outreach and service desk that's out in the main lobby. Um, we're going to have bookmarks, laminated bookmarks available in the next couple of weeks that will outline how you can get involved. Um, you can take them home and prayerfully consider what God would have you get involved and served in. Um, also, if anybody has a ministry that they're passionate about and they're already doing outreach, please stop by the desk because we'd love to include that outreach or service on the bookmark so everybody will know about it. And then on another exciting front, we're excited about uh, getting the ladies' uh, coffee and conversation started again in the next couple months, so keep an eye out for that. Okay, so for an update for the Remnant Cafe, our next meal is going to be February 20th. And there's a couple of ways that you can get involved. First, just show up at 9 o'clock on the 20th and help us prepare for it. Second, we always send out a list of needed food items. So that's an option as well to um, donate those food items. And cash is always appreciated. So, And we just want to thank you as a church for your continued support. We never cease to be amazed how God provides for us. And it's just exceed exciting to see his faithfulness. Amen. Thank you both. And we appreciate the efforts they are putting into helping us be more effective and more um, proactive in ministering to our community. And if you'd like to be part of that, please, uh, you can go to the table afterwards, the counter outside in the lobby and get more information. After church today, we'll have our class on the Olivet Discourse. Today, we're going to focus on what Christ said about the end times as we continue our study on eschatology. That'll be after church. Before church, we have a class on Ephesians with Gene Weborg over in the gym. That's at 9 o'clock. We invite you to try that out. This Wednesday, in our study of Genesis, we're going to look at the institution, the observance of Sabbath. And if you've ever asked yourself, why don't we as evangelical Christians in 2020, why don't we meet on the Sabbath, Saturday as opposed to Sunday, we're going to answer that this Wednesday night. So I invite you to come and bring your notepad with you or join us on live stream. On Sunday, February the 7th, will be our annual business meeting. It is Super Bowl Sunday, but our meetings don't last that long. It'll be right after the morning service. We'll conduct our business and, and have our approval of our new budget. If you did not receive your bottle for the Sarasota Medical Pregnancy Center, they are available at the tables as you leave today. If you want to turn your bottle in, you can come and put it at that table and we'll collect it after the service, and that's where our offering plates are also. If you are new attender of Faith Baptist Church, we haven't passed the offering plates since, I think, February or March. Whenever the COVID protocols kicked in, we haven't passed the offering plates since, but by God's grace and your faithfulness, the offerings have continued to come in. And to be honest, I enjoy not having to take the offering in the service. It's, uh, it's nice to know that you're giving because it's in your heart to give, and we can get right to business. But uh, it is an act of worship. So someday, when we're allowed to do it again, it is an act of worship to put your money in the offering plate for those who don't give online, and we'd like to observe that again someday. Uh, urgent prayer request. First of all, my daughter is due to deliver her little baby boy on Tuesday, 
It could happen before that, but Tuesday for sure, so I'd appreciate your prayers for her, Brooke Cole and her husband Josh, and the little baby who is yet to be named. Uh, we'll find out what that is. And then Mo Bowman is scheduled for his heart procedure on February the 19th, and they'll be coming. It's open heart, but they're coming, well, they're coming in through the side rather than cracking open the chest, but please pray for Mo. And then a a sad but an, a joyful announcement about our, our dear deacon, longtime member, Steve Catlin. He went home to be with the Lord this week. Um, he died of cancer. His memorial service will be next Sunday after church. So as many of you who would like to come, we want to make it as convenient as possible. And we are going to have a fellowship meal after the service. We'd like to invite you to stay. To make that possible, though, we need volunteers to bring food as a potluck dinner type arrangement for that fellowship meal next Sunday after church. There is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby that you can sign up for what food you would bring. Then we need four or five men who'd be willing to come here on Saturday to set up the tables and chairs for probably around 75 to 100 people uh, for the memorial service. And I want to, I'll say more about Steve on that day, but what a Wonderful challenge and encouragement it was to meet with Steve uh, in his last phases of life and just the days before. And those who had a chance to see him, what we all have remarked is even though his body was emaciated from cancer, and severely so, uh, he was cheerful, he was upbeat, he was positive about his faith. And I asked him, what do you want me to tell the church? And he said, number one, tell them that your outpouring of love and attention to him has been magnificent, and you are a very loving, warm church. But number two, he wanted you all to know that it is a lot easier to witness when you know your time is short. And then he said, so don't waste your time, witness. Uh, but it was a very encouraging time to be with Steve, and we were honored to have him here with us all these years, and I hope you'll set aside next Sunday to do that. We also want to pray for our country, and for the sake of objectivity, Let's assume and give the benefit of the doubt that all of our leaders, all those in the White House, all those in the Senate, all those in the House of Representatives have the very best of intentions. So let's assume that. Put that to the side, and we should pray about this. Any restrictions on free speech always lead to restrictions on the free exercise of religion. In history, there's no exception to that rule. If our church, if our nation continues down this path, it won't be long until the government tells the church what it can or cannot say and will take punitive measures if we violate those protocols. And as you know, 30-something years ago, I was a victim of a, a government intrusion into my church ministry where a federal judge told me that I could not speak about a particular topic from the pulpit. Uh, it was overruled in court, and it was thrown out as being unconstitutional, but they tried. A district judge tried to do that 30 years ago. So we know it's in there. So we are the loose cannon. We, we are the monkey in the wrench. We are the fly in the ointment, a free-speaking church. At some point in time, government is going to look at us askew. Um, but let's pray for our country that uh, congressmen, senators, and and appointed leaders will have a sense of uh, wisdom that's silencing dissent, and they're talking about now silencing potential dissenters. We don't even know what that means. How do they identify that? Deplatforming and deprogramming, monitoring emails and internet searches, all that has to be forbidden and avoided at all costs, or it will eventually come to us. So whoever you voted for, put that aside for now. President Biden is in the White House. Kamala Harris is the vice president. We'll have a majority in the Senate of Democrats and in the House. So things are going to go a certain way that advances their political agenda, but it does not change who we are. We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who are commanded in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is our calling, to advance the gospel and to pray for those who 
have authority over us. Let's all please stand and, and let's do that before we worship the Lord in song. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the wonderful privilege and calling and responsibility to pray for our nation who many of us feel like is at a turning point and a risky precipice where the rights of free speech and the free exercise of religion could be in peril. Father, we assume that our leaders, both Democrat, Republican, and Independent, and Libertarian, they all have the best intent for our country and and we'll grant them that, Father, but there's such a difference in philosophy of what it means to be able to speak truth. And I pray that you will pull us back from that initiative now to silence dissent and to identify people of a certain political persuasion and remove them from any public platform, that you will bring that to naught. And allow the church, regardless of what happens, to be bold, to be faithful to you, to speak the truth with compassion and love, with our main focus not being the United States, States, but our main focus being the gospel of Jesus Christ. Return us to that passion and that commitment, and may we approach this new year with a sense of positivity and hope that you can use us, and you can use us in ways that we can't even foresee. May you be honored and pleased with what we do today and our, as we worship in song. For we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. And does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, He has made us a kingdom and priests to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can sing, that you are worthy. That that's the truth, Lord, that you are worthy of all of the glory and all the honor, all the praise, all the blessings. So God, I pray that we would give you these next 45 minutes, Lord, of our life. That we would think on you, we would reflect on you, we would listen to your word, be taught. 
thank you for every breath that we take, for every moment that we have, Lord. I pray that we don't waste it. So God, give us just a, a moment of reflection, a moment of pause in our busy lives, our busy schedules, just to listen to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Testing one, two, three, four, five. There you go. <laughs> you know, by the way, today we're talking about the call to serve. And those guys back there and the ladies up in the top, they serve the church every Sunday by making it possible for us to have sound and amplification and lights. And just give them a round of applause, if you would, for their, their faithful, quiet service every, every Sunday. <clears throat> well, it's going to be an eventful year. Think back to this date last year. We had no idea what was coming in 2020. Last year contained events and situations that none of us foresaw. And we look back on it, we sort of rub our eyes and can't believe what we even saw. And there was nothing we could have done about it. It's obvious our votes don't count. Hey, careful. What if this year is just as dramatic as last year, but in ways that we consider good. Why couldn't that be? Why can't we be optimistic and hopeful that this year could be an amazing year? Why do we have to forecast darkness upon it before the darkness even sets in? What we know for sure is that the Lord will be with us every single step of the way in 2021. He will not leave us or forsake us. He will be beside us, behind us, before us, and he'll be within us, which is why Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. <clears throat> but as we rejoice, let's ground our hearts in faith. If we do that, we can have faith, hope, and love to display in a faith that holds, a faith that stands, and a faith that serves. And I believe on your screen now will be Micah 6, 8. I'd like you to read this aloud with me. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So faith that serves. The word serve has three Greek words in the New Testament. Diakoneo, which means to minister. Where do we get the word deacon from? Duoleuo, which means to serve as a bonded slave. And then a third term, latreuo, which means to work for hire. It's those first two words that we are exhorted to do throughout the New Testament. So what does it mean to serve? It means doing something for someone else that they have requested or that they need or that will bless them or that is in their best interest. So we can all do that. And you might say, well, no one ever asks me to do anything. The beautiful thing about serving is you don't have to be asked. You can create things to do on your own to serve somebody else. The way you do when you love someone, they don't have to tell you things to do for them. <clears throat> you know things. You can create things. You can imagine things you can do to bless them. But serving is unacceptable to the prideful. In John Milton's Paradise Lost, Satan boasts, it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. That is the attitude of pride. But the old folk rock hero, Bob Dylan, wrote during his Christian phase of his songwriting in 1979, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Serving is inevitable. We are all servants whether we realize it or not. Some of us are compliant servants. Some of us are hesitant. Some of us are resistant. Some of us are energetic. But serving is not a bad thing. But if you watch the way we live our lives, you would think that it is. Serving is laudable. 
It's virtuous, it's honorable, and it is respectable. Serving is not hard to understand. When I say the word here, everybody knows what it means. Nor is it hard to find an opportunity to serve. We all know what serving is. We know we are supposed to do it. We know how to do it. And we have plenty of opportunities. So the question hangs out there, why don't we serve more often? Well, the greatest obstacle to service is self. It's you and it's me. Because serving others is inconvenient. It takes up time. It requires energy. It often go goes unnoticed or unappreciated. And when you're serving others, it prevents you from serving yourself. And serving self is human nature. It's part of our design. We were designed to act in our own self-interest, to seek comfort, to seek pleasure and to seek ease. And God filled the world with things that will provide us with comfort and pleasure and ease. Acting in self-interest is not wrong, but when it fails to incorporate the interest of others, it turns into selfishness, of course, which is wrong. So acting in self-interest with no regard to the interest of others, that's being selfish. Acting in self-interest to also benefit the interest of others, that's admirable. But acting in the interest of others at the expense of your own self-interest, that's Christ-like. It's why Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So when it comes to serving, Scripture instructs us, number one, to serve God. Number two, to control our desire to serve ourselves. Number three, to be thankful when someone serves us. And number four, to serve others. And to serve others, it almost requires that you look for the opportunity or else we don't see it when it's there. So let's look at a few verses. Luke 22, 24 through 26, Jesus is talking about a conversation that the disciples are having. Now, there was also a dispute among them, the disciples, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And Jesus responds, He who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. So number one, serving is an exercise in humility. You must see yourself in a certain position to others to be eager and willing and looking for opportunities to serve humility. And it's something every one of us here need to add, apply, and practice in our lives daily is humility. The next one is Galatians 5.13. And it's the word douleo, uh, which means uh, bond slave. It's the word used here. But for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. So serving is an exercise of love. It is a way that you can show affection. It's the way you can show endearment. It's the way you can show belonging. It is the way that you can show um, that you highly regard somebody, even maybe above yourself, is to serve them. But in this passage, liberty and servitude, because the word bond slave, they're compatible. We tend to think that you can't be free and serve at the same time. Serving means bondage. But Paul says, because you love, you take your liberty and you become a servant. So it is a volitional choice. It's something you choose to do because of the way that you think and the way that you feel. And we see here, our service should prioritize other believers. Not just the world, which is a wonderful thing, but each other to take the time to serve those who name the name of Christ. So James says in James chapter 2, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have my works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So serving is an exercise of faith. Faith that does not serve is not fully mature. 
Yesterday I went by to drop off some stuff for my son and his wife and uh, maybe catch a glimpse of my grandchildren. And little Luke has begun walking, and he walks with his hands straight out as balance tools. And he was in the drive when he saw me get out of the truck, and he immediately starts walking towards me with his arms out with a big smile on his face, and he's walking towards me. Before, he may have wanted to do that, but he didn't have the physical maturity to, to walk. Now he does. That is his desire to say hi to Grandpa, motivating his action because his body is mature enough. If you have faith and you're not serving, your faith is not fully mature. doesn't mean it can't be, but you should probably focus on that. And why does it require faith to serve? Because there are times when you're serving and you question, does it matter? Does anyone even notice? Is it really pleasing God? Am I really equipped enough to do this act of service? And do I have enough faith to endure the challenges that are going to come to this service? Serving requires faith because it causes you to step outside of your self-concern and look at the interest of others. In Luke chapter 6, verse 35 through 37, we see something else interesting about faith, about serving. It's an exercise in grace and selflessness. But love your enemies, do good. And the inference is do good to them. Love your enemies and do good to them. And lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you'll be the sons of the Most High. For He is kind to the unthankful and the evil. So if you want to be a servant, you have to serve with a sense of grace towards those who do not deserve it on a human level, who are not your friends, who might even be your enemies. You do good to all and you serve all. That is an extremely difficult attitude to have. And if you have it right now, you might not have it by lunchtime. If you have it at lunchtime, you might lose it by the evening. If you have it all day today, you might not have it tomorrow. This is a volitional choice you have to make that you see yourself as a servant, even to those who you could call your enemy. Throughout the world history, the church has dealt with that perspective many, many times. When their government and their culture hated them, persecuted them, arrested them, tortured them, Yet they had to show love and do good to those very same people. You and I have never really had to do that to a, a great degree. I hope those days never come. But if they do, we will be required to love our enemies and do good to them. And then the selflessness, which is hoping for nothing in return. Don't do it to get something back. Do it because it's needed or it's wanted or blesses. Galatians chapter 6. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Serving is an exercise of endurance. It gets tiring. There are many days when those on the sound and those who work around the church or those who work in various ministries or maybe even your job where you're serving other people, there are just days you don't want to do it. There are days when you're exhausted, when you're empty, when something else makes you get up and go do it. And it can't always be money that you're getting paid. Something else has to drive you. That's why serving requires you to, to not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, there will be a reaping. If you don't quit, don't stop. It requires endurance. But serving also, it doesn't discriminate, but it does prioritize. So Paul writes to the Galatians, do good to everybody, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. I'll talk more about it next Sunday, but Steve Cadlin was a great example of that. Do good to the people of your church. Do good to, to other believers. Do good to those who are in your church. Christian family. That should be the highest priority, as it is in any family. Love your family, and then love those outside as well. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works or your service and glorify your Father in heaven. 
So serving is an exercise of evangelism, <clears throat> which is why that counter out in the lobby, which provides opportunities for outreach, yes, we want to bless people. Yes, we want to help people. We don't necessarily, we're not doing it to get them to come to our church, but we're doing it so they might see the love of Christ. It's evangelistic to serve. And that's why it's important to do it to one another. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you have everything you need in your life in terms of your own sense of well-being and your contentment and your sense of love. It is wonderful to have another believer show you attention, to act as if you matter, to bring something to you or to say something to you or to send something to you. It, it's the bond of us taking care of one another. <clears throat> when serving is not done to draw attention to self or to your church, it leads others to glorify God. And I think we should keep that in mind in these modern days of, of self-promotion and church promotion and constant Instagram, social media, website exaltation of all we do. We need to be careful that our real desire is to glorify God and to serve. Let the service turn their eyes to God, not necessarily towards our church. That's not the highest call of the church is to grow. It's to reach out and serve and minister and evangelize. It means bringing the gospel. In Luke chapter 10, there's a very <clears throat> famous parable, often misunderstood, but you'll all know it when I read it. And it's going to teach us that serving is an exercise expected of a believer. Every one of us here who names the name of Christ, God expects us to serve. Then Jesus answered, and we'll tell you what he was answering in a minute, and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. <clears throat> Likewise, a Levite. When he arrived at the place, he came and looked, and he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And then Jesus said, or the man answered, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do thou likewise. So if the priest and the Levite had been real people rather than one-dimensional characters in an illustration, they may have had some good reasons for not getting involved, such as the ceremonial uncleanness of, of seeing blood or, or a defiled man, or the responsibilities that they had. They had a schedule. They, they had to keep moving because they had an important date at the temple. Or the area was not a safe place to stop, and if they stop and help this guy, they might get attacked, and then their wife or their children would be fatherless or widowed. Or they couldn't really do anything to help at this point. The guy's already been beaten, and his clothes are gone. He's already, I can't really do anything. But they weren't real. These aren't real. This is not a historical account. This is a sermon illustration. It's a, a parable. There is no backstory to these people's lives or the reasons they didn't serve. It was told to illustrate one particular point. What they displayed was indifference, lack of love, lack of compassion, and a lack of kindness. He's portraying to them these faithful Jews, priest and a Levite were indifferent, unkind, and lack compassion. And then this vile character called the Samaritan, which was a dirty word to a faithful Jew, he displayed a non-discriminatory and generous compassion that caused him to meet a need because he had the resources and there was an opportunity. So this parable was given in response to a question a self-justifying lawyer who had asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? 
And he asked that because Jesus had just said to them, a child of God is to love his neighbor. So this lawyer wanted to make sure, well, there are certainly some parameters here we have to consider. Well, said, well, who is my neighbor? So the question is not answering, how do you live good enough to go to heaven? What should governments do? It is, who is your neighbor? And the answer is, everybody you come across. <laughs> The parable is often used in Christianity today to rationalize welfare or the lean towards socialism or Marxism or social justice initiatives by a community or a government. It is not about any government program. It is not about a political platform. This parable of the Good Samaritan is about individual believers having compassion. And then when those individual believers get together in a church, that the church will have compassion as a local body of believers. That having compassion and doing good is a trademark of Christianity. It has nothing to do with government or politics or taxes or federal programs. It's what are you and I doing towards and for those in need. That one way we can reach them is to be kind and compassionate. I'm sure in this parable, if they were real characters, that gentleman who had been beaten up probably saw the Samaritan as a great friend for the rest of his life. But then they're not real characters. It's not history. It's an illustration. So serving is central to the life of a church. What we do outside of here to others and what we do for one another. A faith that holds and a faith that stands for principle has to be a faith it also bends its knee and serves one another and then the world. Listen to this passage in Ephesians 4 before we close in prayer. God is revealing to Paul what he has done and what he expects. So Paul writes, He himself, God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor-teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. From the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. In other words, God has equipped us with giftings and abilities and talents and callings so that we can all minister to one another and be a healthy body of believers. And if He's equipped us, He expects us to use it. Now, I'm so old... I played football back in the days when the helmet was not considered for protection. The helmet was a weapon. And I remember my coaches telling us, point blank, you know what that helmet's for? It's for you to drive it into the head of the other person. And if you can, aim it right at the ear hole. That was the way we played football back in the 70s and 80s. The helmet was a weapon. We were equipped, but maybe not the best use of that piece of equipment. It's more to protect your own head, but they didn't know things back then. But the shoulder pads, the knee pads, the thigh pads, all of that was designed so that you could interact. It wasn't designed to make your time on the bench more comfortable or to make you look better in the team picture or so that people would say, well, there goes a football player. We're equipped to use the equipment to advance the cause. God has equipped us. Every one of us has some kind of gifting. The Bible reveals in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Are you using your gift? If you're not, find a way. Find a way to serve. If you can find a place to serve in your family, in your community, in your church, find a place to serve. You sort of can't go wrong. No one's going to mind you being willing to serve and eager to serve as long as you can follow instructions. As we pray and move into 2021, may we as a church be servants of God, servants of one another, and service to those, servants to those
who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that has made them confront their standing with God. We need to serve them as well. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you've honored us by calling us servants, by equipping us to serve, and then placing all around us opportunities to do so. We thank you that our Savior set the example by being a servant to us, even washing his disciples' feet. And although he is seeking such to worship him, he knew that we were incapable of doing so without his intervention. So he came to serve us, to reconcile us to you. Father, help us to have that same perspective, that same zeal, that same attitude. And Lord, those who right now in this church family who are serving others and who are at times exhausted, stretched too thin, looking for ways to refresh and encourage themselves, may you grant them that, that second wind of grace that comes from spending time with you. May you help them see the reward of their labors even if they can't see any tangible evidence that all of us will know that service is never and effective when it's done with the right heart attitude and done in love. Make us servants of you, of one another, and of a world that's dying without the gospel. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for a moment of meditation, ask God what he would have you do with this message today. What does he want to add to your life? What does he want to you to remove so you can be more effective? but ask him what he wants you to do with the call to be a servant. Heavenly Father, if there's somebody listening today, either online or in this room, who has never trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, who has never received the service that he provided by dying on the cross and rising from the dead and ascending into heaven to sit at your right hand. May they right now open up their heart and express their faith that Jesus Christ is God. And may they come to him and trust him as Lord and Savior, even right now. May this be the moment they're reborn. May this be the moment they become true servants. And Father, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the years, we've had uh, some wonderful opportunities to have some very special and faithful servants in our church family, and one of them is Matt Favero, and he has a special announcement he'd like to make, and I'd like to tell you uh, when he's all said and done that uh, we would be a, a poor place without the investment that Matt has given us for, for a few years, and I want you, him to be able to tell you what is on his heart. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Uh, after a lot of, I wrote it down this time, uh, after a lot of prayer and conversation, Kelsey and I have decided to step away from our role at Faith Baptist Church. Uh, however, our last Sunday will be July 4th, so we got some, some time here together. I deeply respect the call to be a pastor, and when Pastor Dave approached me almost five years ago, which is crazy, about joining the staff at FBC, a lot of it was about finding out if I was called to be a pastor, and I have determined that I don't believe that I am. It is because I respect the calling of being a pastor that Kelsey and I both felt that it was time, uh, it was best for me to step aside and give someone who has that calling the opportunity to pastor here. I would like to assure everyone that this was not an easy decision, um, and we as a family have spent the last year trying to determine what the Lord would have us do, but ultimately we feel at peace about our decision, although it is very, very bittersweet. Kelsey and I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed our church family and we personally cannot adequately express how grateful we are to you for your support of us and our ministry. We are excited for the future for Faith Baptist Church, and we'll be praying that the Lord will provide someone in our stead that will take FBC to places beyond imagining. Uh, may the Lord bless all of you, and again, thank you so much for your support over the years. Your appreciation, if you would. In more ways than I can possibly tell you since Matt joined the staff, he has been a constant help and encouragement. He's done everything that's ever been asked of him. He's done it over and 
above and beyond. He's done it without acknowledgement. He's done it without having to have anybody say, good job, Matt. He's been a, a, a perfect example of what a staff member should be, and our friendship is intact. Our sense of uh, being sort of a surrogate father and son is intact. We love each other. There's no problems or conflicts. It's just become obvious to he and his wife that they, they need to, to, to do something else to be in, in God's will. So in the future, we'll be making some changes and looking to make some decisions that I hope you'll be in prayer about. We'll have to have some voids to fill that we sure we know that the body will come together and somebody will step up and we'll be presenting those opportunities to you in the near future. hate to ask you to do this, but stand up again and we'll be dismissed in prayer. And you don't need to rush down and say anything to Matt. He's going to be here for four or five more months. So you can have your time to let him know how much you appreciate all he's done in the, in the months ahead. Father, we thank you for this glorious day and the opportunity for this brand new year that has just a clean slate in front of it. And it might have challenges and it might be frustrating, but it could also have some of the most glorious moments of victory and inspirements that could make us be different Christians and different believers and different friends and family members. And we pray you'll help us respond to every day that comes before us in this new year with faith and joy and hope and love. And may we seek to serve. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. The after church Bible class will start in about five minutes and 27.4 seconds.